Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'm Shelley Guten, and I'm going to be reading one of my all-time favorite short stories, uh, The Cat and the Coffee Drinkers, written by Max Steele, who um, is, was a friend of Carol Ettinger's, and uh, I think wrote in, um, from this area, this, the, this region. I sometimes wonder if the generation of mothers who from 1910 to 1940 sent their five-year-olds to the kindergarten of Miss Effie Barr had much of an idea what their children were learning in her one-room schoolhouse. Even though in 1930, the southern town in which she lived was no longer small, and even though she was already in her 70s, Miss Effie knew all of the children in her school a year and often longer before they appeared before her for lessons. My mother, properly gloved and chapeaued, began taking me to call on her when I was four. Her house was a good place to visit. It was large and gray and was well set back from the same street that I lived on. There in the summer, in the shade of water oaks, Miss Effie, dressed in black, would be sitting, knitting or embroidering with her big gray cat, uh, which sat either at or sometimes on her feet. Slow, uncertain music would be coming through open windows from the music room where her older sister, Miss Hattie, gave piano lessons. Miss Effie never seemed to watch a child on such visits or offer him anything like cookies or lemonade or, any, or say anything to endear herself to a youngster. Instead, she would talk lady talk to, with the mother and hardly pausing, say to the child, you can pull up the wild onions on the lawn if you've nothing better to do. There was no suggestion in her voice that it was a game or that there would be a reward. She simply stated what could be done if one took a notion. Usually, a child did. There was no nonsense about Miss Effie. One morning in late September, my mother and I were standing with 11 other mothers and children on the porch. Miss Effie looked everyone over carefully from where she stood with one hand on the screen door. She checked a list on the other hand against the young faces on the porch to be sure that these were the children she had chosen from the 40 or more who had visited her in the summer. Apparently satisfied, or at least reconciled to another year of supplementing her income, for no southern lady of her generation worked, she opened the door wide and said, in her indifferent tone, children inside. When one mother tried to lead her reluctant son into the dark parlor, Miss Effie said, mothers outside. When the children were all inside and the mothers outside, Miss Effie latched the screen, thanked the mothers for bringing the children, and reminded them that classes begin at 8.30 and ended at noon. The tuition, $2 a week, would be acceptable each Friday, and each child, as part of his training, should be given the responsibility of delivering the money in an envelope bearing the parent's signature. She thanked the mothers again in such a way that there was nothing for them to do except wander together in a group down the gravel walk. I'm going to skip part of it because it's too long. And the part I'm skipping is where she shows the children all through this big uh, southern house. And she tells them, 
I don't want you to be wondering about things when you should be listening. So that's why she shows them everything ahead of time. I'm cutting some things out <laughs> to finish on time. So after showing them all the rugs and the doodads and things upstairs and down, she gathers them together. Now, out the back door, all of you. She made us all stand on the ground off the steps while she lowered herself step by step with the aid of a cane that she kept on a nail by the front door. Now you've seen my house and you won't see it again unless I give your mother's fruitcake and coffee at Christmas. And I don't think I will, not this year. Do you ever get tired of fruitcake and coffee at Christmas? We all said we did, since it was clear that she did. Over there is the barn. We'll see it some other time. And that is the greenhouse. We'll be seeing it often. And here's the classroom where we'll be. She pointed with her cane to a square brick building that before the Civil War had been the kitchen. The door was open. She shepherded us along a brick walk with her cane, not allowing any of us near enough to her to topple her over. At the door, she said, go on in. We crowded in, and when we were all through the door, she summoned us back out. Now, which of you are boys? The boys raised their hands, following her lead. And which girls? The three girls had already separated themselves from the boys and nodded together. All right then, young gentlemen, she said, regarding us. Let's let the young ladies enter first, or I'll think that you're all young ladies. The girls, looking timid and pleased, entered. We started in after them. Wait just a minute, young gentlemen, she said. Haven't you forgotten something? We looked about for another girl. Me, she announced. You've forgotten me. She passed through our huddle, separating us with her stick, and marched us into the kitchen. This was the kitchen before the Civil War, this brick classroom. Inside, as well as out, the kitchen was mainly of brick. The walls and floors were brick, and the hearth and the huge chimney, except for closet, cupboard on each side of it, were brick. The ceiling, however, was of beams and broad boards, and the windows were of wavy glass and casements that opened out like shutters. There were three large wooden tables, and at each table, four chairs. Again, she had to show us everything. The fireplace would be used in only the coldest weather, she said. At other times, the iron stove at one side of the room would be used. A captain's chair between the fireplace and the stove was her own and not to be touched by us. A sewing table overflowing with yarn and knitting needles was for her own use and not for ours. One cupboard, one next to her, and one that held dishes. She opened its door. She would let us see the other one later. The tables and chairs, and at the far end of the room, some pegs for coats and jackets were all ours, to do with as we pleased. It was, she explained, our schoolroom, and therefore, since we were young ladies and gentlemen, she was sure we would keep it clean. As a matter of fact, she saw no reason why we should not begin with the first lesson, sweeping and dusting. She opened the other cupboard and showed us a mop, a bucket, some rags and brushes, and three brooms. We were not divided into teams. We were not given certain areas to see who could sweep the area cleanest. We were simply told that young ladies should naturally be able to sweep and that young gentlemen should at some times in their lives certainly be expected to sweep a room clean. The instruction was simple. You get a good grip on the handle and set two. She handed out three brooms and started 
us boys sweeping from the fireplace toward the front door. She made simple corrections. You'll raise a dust flirting the broom upward. Keep it near the floor. Hold lower on the handle. You'll get more dirt. Don't bend over. You'll be tired before the floor is clean. When we swept, Miss Effie made a big red enamel coffee pot of coffee on a small alcohol stove. Since the room had not been swept, she admitted, all summer, there was a respectable pile of brick dust, sand, and sweepings near the door by the time she said, we'll have lunch now. It was already 10 o'clock. After lunch, I'll teach you how to take up trash and to dust. Everyone needs to know that. Lunch, it happened, was a half a mug of coffee each. The spoon, one spoon of sugar, she said, was sufficient. If we felt it necessary to use sugar at all, she didn't. There was milk for those who could not or would not. She spoke as though using milk were a defect of character. Take their coffee black. I dare say not any of us had ever had coffee before, and Robert Barnes said he hadn't. Good, Miss Effie said, so you will have learned something today. Miriam Wells, however, said on reflection that her parents wouldn't approve of her drinking coffee. Very well, Miss Effie said, don't drink it. And the next time I offer you any, if I ever do, simply say, no thank you, ma'am. The next day, Miriam Wells was drinking it along with the rest of us. Let's get this clear right this minute. Your parents don't need to know what you do when you're under my instruction. Her words gave us a warm feeling, and from that moment on, the schoolroom became a special, safe, and rather secret place. That day we learned further how to rinse out mugs and place them in a pan to be boiled later, how to take up trash, and how to dust. At noon, we were taught the right way to put on our sweaters or coats, how to approach one at a time our teacher or any lady we should happen to be visiting, and say, thank you for the coffee or whatever we had been served, and how to say goodbye and turn and leave the room without running or laughing. It wasn't as easy as you may think. The next morning, Robert Barnes was waiting on his steps when I walked by his house. Since he and I lived nearer to the bars than any of the other children, we were the first to arrive at the schoolhouse. Miss Effie sat in her captain's chair brushing the cat, which lay on a tall stool in front of her. We entered without speaking. Without looking up, Miss Effie said, Now, young gentlemen, let's try that again outside. Take off your caps before you step through the door and say, Good morning, ma'am, as you come through the door. Smile if you feel like it. Don't if you don't. She herself did not smile as we went out and re-entered in the manner she suggested. However, this time she looked directly at us when we returned our good mornings. Later, each child who entered the room in what she felt to be a rude way was sent out to try again. Strangely enough, she did not smile at anyone, and looking back, I see that part of her efficiency was that she treated each child as an adult and each lesson as though it were a serious task. Even though there were occasional crying scenes or temper tantrums among us, she herself never lost her firm, rational approach. Sitting in her captain's chair, dressed in black from head to toe, except for a cameo, small gold loop earrings, and a gold opal ring on her right hand, she was usually as solemn and considerate as a judge on his bench. 
It is strange that I can remember her calm expression and the dignity of her bearing, but not one feature of her angular face. That morning, Miss Effie waited until all of us were properly in, in before addressing us as a class. This is Mr. Thomas, she said of the cat on the stool. He is a no good cat and he doesn't like children, so leave him alone. I'd have nothing to do with him myself except that he happens to belong to me because his mother and grandmother belonged to me. They were no good either. But since he does belong to me and since he is here, we might as well talk about cats. She showed us how to brush a cat, how he liked to be rubbed under his neck, how he didn't like his ears or whiskers touched, how his ears turned to pick up sounds, how he stretched and shut his paw pads when he was tickled on the stomach or feet, and how he twitched his tail when annoyed. Mr. Thomas is a fighter, she said, and let us look at the scars from a dozen or more fights. And he's getting too old to fight, but he hasn't got sense enough to know that. She looked at us where we stood in more or less a large circle around her. Now let's see. I don't know your names. I know your mother's, but not your names. She would, she said, indicate us one at a time, and we were to give her our names in a clear, loud voice while looking her right in the eye. Then we were to choose a chair at one of the three tables. I hate the way most people become shy when they say their names. Be proud of it and speak up. When the young ladies had finished giving their names, she said they did admirably well. They chose to sit at the same table. One or two boys shouted their names in a silly fashion and had to repeat. One or two looked away to decide on a chair or watch the cat they claimed, and so had to repeat. I did not speak loud enough and had to say my name three times. One lad refused to say his name a second time, and that day and the next she called him Mr. No Name. The third day afterward he did not appear, nor the fourth, nor fifth. And the next week, a new boy from the waiting list gave his name in a perfect fashion and took Mr. No Name's place. We learned about cats and names the second day then. The following day, Barbara Ware and Robert Barnes distinguished themselves by claiming to like their coffee black with no sugar, just the way Miss Effie was convinced it should be drunk. At the end of the second week, we reviewed what we had learned by sweeping and dusting the room again. And each day we practiced coming in and leaving properly and saying our name in a way that sounded as though we were proud of it and of ourselves, which by then we were. The third week, putting down the cat brush and shooing Mr. Thomas off the stool, Miss Effie said that she too was proud of the way we identified ourselves with eyes level and unblinking. But now, she said, I want to teach you to give a name that is not your own without any shiftiness. She sat with both thin hands clasping the arms of her chair and gave a short lecture. Not everyone, she said, was entitled to know your name. Some people of a certain sort would ask when it was none of their business. It would be unnecessarily rude to tell them so. But we could simply tell such people a name that had nothing whatever to do with our own. She did not mention kidnappings, but talked rather about ruthless salesmen, strangers on buses and trains, and tramps and beggars wandering through the neighborhood. For the purpose of practice, 
all the young ladies would learn to give, in a courteous, convincing manner, the name Polly Livingstone. The boys would be, when asked, William Johnson, a name I can still give with much more conviction than my own. That day and the next, each of us gave his real name before, before the coffee break and after his false name. We liked the exercises wherein we went up to her, shook her hand if she offered it, and gave her our false names, confronting, without staring, her solemn gaze with our own. If we smiled or twisted, we had to stand by the fireplace until, until we could display more poise. At the end of the first month, Miss Effie said that she was fairly pleased with our progress. I have taught you thus far mainly about rooms. Most people spend most of their lives in rooms, and now you know about them. She mentioned some of the things we had learned. What else have we learned about rooms? She then asked, letting Mr. Thomas out the window onto the sunny ledge where he liked to sit. How to drink coffee, Miriam Wells said rather proudly. No, Miss Effie said, that has to do with another series, which includes how to accept things and how to get rid of things you don't want. Fat meat, bones, seeds, pits, peelings, and she added under her breath, parents. She paused for a moment and looked pleased, as though she might wink or smile, but, but her angular face did not change its expression very much. No, besides, I'm not pleased by the way you're drinking coffee. She then said for the first time a speech that she repeated so often by the end of the year that we sometimes shouted it in our play on the way home. Coffee is a beverage to be enjoyed for its flavor. It is not a food to be enriched with milk and sugar. Only certain types of people try to gain nourishment from it. In general, they are the ones, I suspect, who show their emotions in public. We had, I am sure, no idea what the speech meant. She expected all of us by June, possibly by Christmas, to be drinking it black. Is there anything else we need to know about, about rooms, she asked. How to build them, Philip Pike said. That, Miss Effie said, you can't learn from me, unfortunately. I wish I knew. She looked thoughtfully out the window to the ledge on which Mr. Thomas was grooming himself. Windows, she said, how to clean windows. Again, the cupboard door was open, and by noon the next day, we knew how to clean windows inside and out, and how to adjust all the shades in a room to the same level. When it turned cold in November, cold enough for the stove but not the fireplace, we settled down to the real work that gave Miss Effie's kindergarten its reputation, reading. Miss Effie liked to read and was well known in the town and especially among the public school teachers that the two or three hundred children she had taught had grown up reading everything they could find. She assured us that even though we were only five years old, we would be reading better than the third grade school children by the end of the year. Each morning the stove was already hot when we arrived. She would brush Thomas a while, and then, when we were all in our places and warm, she would hand out our reading books, which we opened every day to the first page and laid flat before us on the tables. While we looked at the first page, she began heating the big red enamel pot of coffee, and also because we now needed nourishment to keep warm, a black iron pot of oatmeal. 
Then Miss Effie would sit down, allow Thomas to jump into her lap, and begin reading, always from the first page, in an excited tone. She would read to the point exactly where we had finished the day before, so that from necessity, she read faster and faster each day, while we turned our pages, which we knew by heart, when we saw her ready to turn hers. Then, one after another, we went up to her and sat on Mr. Thomas's stool by the stove and read aloud to her, while those at the table either listened or read or played with architectural blocks. The child on the stool was rewarded at the end of each sentence with two spoonsfuls of oatmeal if he read well, and one if not so well. Since we each read twice, once before coffee and once after, we did not really get hungry before we left the school at noon. Of course, those who read fast and read well ate more oatmeal than the others. In addition to reading lessons, which were the most important part of the day, we learned to take money and shopping lists to Mr. Zeniger's grocery store to pay for groceries and to bring, back with, bring them back with a change. Usually, two or three of us went together to the store, which was on the next block. At the same time, three or four others might be learning to paint flower pots or to catch frying-sized chickens in the chicken yard back of the barn. And on sunny days that winter, we would all go out to the greenhouse for an hour and learn how to reset ferns and start bulbs on wet rocks. In March, we learned how to rake Miss Ellie's tennis court to fill in any holes with powdery sand and to line up and tie strings properly so that later a yard man could mark the lines on the court with lime. The tennis court was for rent to high school girls and boys in the afternoons during the spring and summer. By Easter time, we were all proficient sweepers, dusters, shoppers, bulb setters, readers, and black coffee drinkers. Miss Effie herself, now that spring was in the air, hated to sit all morning by the stove where we'd been all winter. Usually, after an hour or so of reading, all aloud and at once, we would follow her into the yard and prune the first breath of spring, the jessamine, the yellow bells, and the peach and pear trees. We kept the branches we cut off, and we stuck them in buckets of water in the greenhouse. Miss Effie printed a sign that said, Flowers for Sale, and we helped her tie it to a tree next to the sidewalk. In addition to the flowering branches that we had forced, she sold ferns and the jonquils that we had set and that were now in bud. All in all, spring was a busy time, and I remember only one other thing we learned. One warm May morning, we arrived to find Mr. Thomas badly torn up about the ears, his eyes shut, his breathing noisy on a folded piece of carpet near the open door of the schoolhouse. We wanted to pet him and talk to him, but Miss Effie, regarding him constantly, said no, that he had obviously been not only a bad cat, but a foolish one. She believed he had been hit by a car while running from some dogs, and that that was how the dogs got to him. She and Miss Hattie had heard the fight during the night. At any rate, he had managed to crawl under the steps where the dogs couldn't get to him anymore. At dawn, she had come down and thrown hot water on the dogs and rescued him. As soon as a boy from her cousin's office arrived, her cousin was a doctor, she was going to teach us how to put a cat to sleep, she said. 
we pointed out that he already seemed to be asleep. But, she explained, not taking her eyes from the cat, we are going to put him to sleep so that he won't wake up. You're going to kill him? Robert Barnes said. You could say that. We were all greatly disturbed when we understood that this was the last we would see of Mr. Thomas. But Miss Effie had no sympathy, apparently, for the cat or for us. He is suffering, and even if he is a no-good cat, he shouldn't suffer. When Barbara Ware began to whimper, Miss Effie said, Animals are not people. Her tone was severe enough to stop Barbara from crying. After the boy had arrived with the package and left, Miss Effie stopped her reading, and going to one of the cupboards, she got out a canvas bag with a drawstring top. Now, if you young ladies will follow us, I'll ask the young gentleman to bring Mr. Thomas. We all rushed to be the ones to lift the piece of carpet and bear Mr. Thomas after her through her garden to the tool shed. Just wrap the carpet around him, tight, head and all, she instructed when we reached the tool shed. After we had him wrapped securely, Miss Effie opened the package and read the label, chloroform. She explained to us the properties of the chemical while we rolled the cat tighter and stuck him tail first into the canvas bag. Miss Effie asked us to stand back and hold our breath. She then soaked a large rag with the liquid and poured the rest directly onto the cat's head and onto the carpet. She poked the rag into the rolled carpet so that it hid Mr. Thomas completely. Then she drew the drawstring tight and slung the cat, bag and all, into the tool shed. She shut the door firmly and latched it. That'll cut out the air, she said. Back in the schoolhouse, we tried to listen as she read without her usual excited tone, but we were all thinking about Mr. Thomas in the tool shed. Well, she finally said, if you will excuse me a moment, I'll go see if my cat is dead. We watched from the windows as she walked with her cane through the garden to the tool shed, and we could see her open the door and bend over the sack for a long time. At last, she straightened up and locked the door again. She came back with the same unhalting gait and stood for a moment in the sun before the open door of the schoolhouse. When I dismiss you, you're to go straight home. And if they want to know why you're home early, she stopped and studied the ground as though she had lost there her cameo or her words. Tell them the only thing Miss Effie had to teach you today was how to kill a cat. Without waiting for us to leave, she walked in her usual dignified fashion down the brick wall, walk, and up the back steps and into her house, shutting the kitchen door firmly behind her. I know that that was not the last day of school for I remember helping to spread tablecloths on the reading tables, and I remember helping to serve tea cakes to the mothers who came the last day and stood on a tennis court near a table where Miss Hattie was serving coffee. But in the final, but the final definite picture I have of Miss Effie is that of her coming down the garden from the tool shed and standing in the doorway a moment to say she had nothing more to teach us. Thank you.